The Dead Sea could then, once its surface reached a few feet above sea level, empty into the Gulf of Aqaba, eventually healing the oceans. The sea would then be perhaps twice as long and half again as wide as it is now. Jericho would be prime beachfront property. But once the salt levels equalized, it would be capable of supporting all kinds of marine life. The idea that the Dead Sea will indeed empty into the Gulf of Aqaba is implied by Ezekiel, who reported, Everything will live wherever the river goes. This admittedly wild theory, one I would blush to even assign a speculation factor to, is supported by a subtle hint dropped into Ezekiel's narrative. The new Dead Sea fishing industry will be concentrated in the northern half of the sea. Why is that? Not coincidentally, the same thing is true of the Sea of Galilee. All the major fishing towns, like Capernaum, were clustered along its northern shore. The answer, it turns out, is quite simple. The waters are more oxygen-rich where the streams feeding the lake enter than where they exit, which is something the fish prefer, and fishermen congregate where the fish are most plentiful. The implication is that in the newly healed Dead Sea, the flow will remain from north to south, strongly suggesting an exit into the Gulf of Aqaba. That, however, reminds us of an unresolved problem. Sometime during the tribulation in the second bowl judgment, every living creature in the sea died. Revelation 16.3 So where did the breeding stock come from? I see three possible explanations. One, every is a conversational exaggeration, simply meaning the vast majority. Two, some marine life were sheltered from the plague in bodies of water not included in what John described as the sea. Or three, Yahshua recreated or resurrected the flora and fauna of the oceans as he healed the waters from their blood-like state. I don't have a problem with any of these theories. Take your pick or come up with a scripturally sound alternative of your own. The bottom line is that the oceans and seas, though only the Dead Sea is specifically mentioned, will be restored to their former bountiful condition, or even better, since nothing at all is in the Dead Sea today. Bear in mind that Ezekiel was discussing only the eastward river. Zechariah also mentions a second westward-flowing river that empties into the Med. One way or another, metaphorically and physically, healing flows from Yahshua's temple in Jerusalem, and it will eventually reach every corner on the earth. God's restoration of the millennial world will be spectacular. Not only will the earth, especially Israel, be healed from the ravages of the tribulation, it will once again be transformed into the kind of paradise that man hasn't known since the days of the patriarchs. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of Yahweh, the excellency of our God. The best part of the beautiful new surroundings will be the glory of God dwelling here among men. Therefore, Isaiah encourages those living through the bad times, promising Yahweh's timely intervention. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful-hearted, Be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. The healing miracles of Yahshua's first century advent will be seen once again in the earth, probably on a much larger scale. Note the order of things. First a vengeance against God's enemies, then salvation for his friends, then the physical healing of their bodies and their land. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals, where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. 
Isaiah 34, 1 through 7. Deserts are apparently going out of style in Israel. Isaiah continues. For Yahweh will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of Yahweh. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving in the voice of melody. Isaiah 51.3 It's tempting to imagine that this kind of restoration will happen all over the earth. I believe that it could, but won't, not everywhere. On one hand, the rivers flowing east and west from the temple will heal every place their walls touch. On the other hand, places whose people refuse to honor Yahshua are promised drought. Egypt and Edom are singled out in Scripture as nations who will suffer this fate. Though everyone who enters the millennium will be a believer, their children will have to make up their minds, and their choices will determine whether they will receive God's blessings or not. Some who are familiar with the final chapters of Revelation are saying, Boy, those river prophecies from Zeke and Zach sure sound familiar. Yes, they should. Here's what John saw. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22, 1 and 2. The puzzle here is the timing. John's statement comes very near the end of a discussion of a new heaven and new earth, which is very different from the restored millennial world. We'll cover that subject in a later chapter. John speaks of one river. Zechariah describes two. Ezekiel says the river flowed from beneath the temple, but John's description specifically says that there is no temple in the New Jerusalem and that the water flows instead from God's throne. We must conclude, then, that John's river is not the same as those described by Ezekiel and Zechariah, however similar they look. The millennium is a dress rehearsal for the eternity that follows. In the same way, I get the feeling that the millennial rivers are like an artist's sketch, but the one that flows from the New Jerusalem is the actual painting, God's masterpiece. These rivers aren't the only place where we run into a bit of confusion between the millennial kingdom and the eternity that follows. Consider the issue of light. Again, we are dealing with an area with strong metaphorical overtones. To shed light upon something is to reveal truth, and that's what Yahweh is all about. But the scriptural record presents some apparent contradictions on the subject, just as it did with the rivers. The solution is to be found in separating the millennial kingdom facts from those dealing with the new heaven and the new earth that will follow. The key to the time period we're seeing in any given passage is the source of the light. It's often tricky. We need to keep our eyes open. Both times are spoken of in this example. The Mighty One, Yahweh our God, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Psalm 50, 1 and 2. In the first statement, the sun is still in view. In the second, however, God is seen as the source of light. We have crossed over from the millennium to eternity in mid-paragraph. Keeping this distinction in mind, let's look at a few informative passages. Isaiah writes, The light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day that Yahweh binds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. Isaiah thirty twenty six. We're definitely talking about the millennium here since the sun is the earth's light source. But the sun's light will be increased by a factor of seven. This is characterized as a good thing, so we presume that there is no accompanying increase in the heat, as we saw in the tribulation's fourth bowl judgment. It's not a plague, it's a blessing. 
We aren't really given enough information to be dogmatic about it, but we might logically presume that this gift of extra sunlight will shorten growing seasons, nourish oceanic phytoplankton, the free-floating photosynthetic flora that convert inorganic compounds into complex organic compounds, the very foundation of the marine food chain, and accelerate the regrowth of the forests lost during World War III when one-third of the world's trees were burned up. How Yahweh intends to do this without turning the earth into a charcoal briquette is beyond my meager scientific understanding. Maybe he intends to restore the water vapor canopy that, I surmise, surrounded our planet before the flood of Noah, the protective barrier so dense that it took 40 days and nights to precipitate onto the earth. The millennium is all about restoration, so it's a distinct possibility. When the thousand years are gone, however, Yahweh has a whole new thing planned. The centerpiece of the new heaven and the new earth is called the New Jerusalem, of which John wrote, The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Revelation 21:23. I freely admit that I've got no earthly idea how this is going to work, but we can be reasonably certain that as a source of light and energy, Yahweh himself will prove to be infinitely superior to the flaming ball of hydrogen and helium that's been serving us so faithfully for the past who knows how long, a sun that he himself created with a snap of his fingers, so to speak. All I can really do is wonder in awe at the greatness of God and point out the Old Testament confirmation. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of Yahweh is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. This will be literally fulfilled during the tribulation, if you'll recall. But Yahweh will rise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. This is, in admittedly poetic language, what we've seen as a way of life during the millennium. The Gentiles will honor Israel as they come to worship at the feet of Yahshua. A few verses later, we've shifted our paradigm into high gear. The energy source for the new Jerusalem, the eternal city, something we'll cover in depth later, is described. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you. Yahweh will be to you an everlasting light, and your God your glory. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself. For Yahweh will be your everlasting light, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. Isaiah 60, 1-3, 19 and 20. It's no accident that the prophet associated the eternal light of Yahweh with the end of mourning. Ever since the first sin in the Garden of Eden, man has shown a propensity to be in awe of big, bright, shiny things in the sky. In our fallen state, it was only a matter of time before we deified the sun and moon, and Satan was ready and waiting with a plethora of variations on the theme, anything to get us to take our eyes off the one true God. Don't assume that the worship of the sun or moon is a relic of a Bible bygone age either. Today, 1.3 billion Muslims worship their moon god, Allah, and the subtle inroads of Mithra-style sun god worship are still plaguing many of the rest of us, even within the church, whether we know it or not. So we shouldn't be surprised to see that, once we've all made our choices, Yahweh would eliminate the sun and moon altogether. Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed, for Yahweh of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. Isaiah 24:23. When we finally realize the difference between creator and creation, then Yahweh will be our everlasting light and the days of our mourning shall be ended. Amen. 